Well, good morning. I'm Fred Cole coming to you from Jesus for the Nations in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Today's video is called A Call to Worship. Right now we're in March of 2023. We're starting to see a outpouring of the Holy Spirit in different places on the earth. And it always leads to worship intimacy intimacy with the Lord Jesus and worship are synonymous have you ever been so thankful to the Lord for what he's doing in your life that you just want to lift up your hands and say thank you Lord Jesus and just sing him a love song well how do we properly tell the Lord that we love him few years ago I was listening to Dr. Frederick K.C. Price and he said he struggled with telling the Lord how much he loved him and then one day he saw it in the Word. John 14 15 if you love me you will obey my commandments that's what the Lord Jesus said he said follow what I tell you well let's look at some of the earliest uh, people that, that I believe the Lord Jesus is the one that, that walked and talked with Adam and Eve in the garden. And so I believe the communication is from a pre-existent uh, encounter of the Lord Jesus with Cain and Abel. And let's see what, see what happened with them. Genesis chapter 4 verse 1 through 5. Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve. And she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, With the Lord's help I have produced a man. Later she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd, while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cable, Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry and he looked dejected. Well, there's a couple of things that we need to know about what happened with Cain and Abel. Uh, number one, the ground was cursed because of Cain's, of uh, Adam's sin so its produce was cursed and was not acceptable. So Cain's offering of the produce from the ground was not acceptable because of sin. Now let's look at uh, the at this point in time in history prior to the flood the the first humans weren't allowed to eat meat and it wasn't until after the flood that the scripture says that the land was cleansed by the flood so there has to be a reason why Abel had a flock I've heard people say well they had him for he had them for clothing I don't think that's I don't think they needed that much clothing I think there was something that Abel heard I think Cain and Abel both heard what the Lord wanted as an offering. Cain offered what he wanted to. Abel offered what he heard the Lord wanted. And uh, a clue is in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. Without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. So I believe that Abel on a regular basis offered blood offerings to cover the sins of Adam and Eve and the rest of his brothers and sisters. The Jewish tradition is that there were 33 brothers and sisters uh, that came from uh, Adam and Eve. And so, uh, whatever the reason is, Abel's offering, he had to have heard something. Remember, faith comes from hearing and then acting on it and so Abel's offering was was accepted because he had heard from the Lord what he was supposed to do I 
I'm going, I'm going somewhere with this. To understand the offering the Lord wants, we need to go to Mount Sinai. Moses. Again, I believe that was the Lord Jesus on Mount Sinai talking to Moses face to face. Had to be an awesome time. The Lord Jesus, Yahweh, tells Moses he is going to come live with Israel. That had to be something for Moses. Whenever he's standing there and the Lord saying this, the, the Lord manifesting himself in a blazing fire on the top of that mountain and it's shaking. And the Lord says, I'm going to come live with you, Moses. And Moses thinking to himself, he going to kill everybody. So, uh, Moses uh, composed himself and listen to the Lord's plan of how it's going to be possible for this awesome God to come and live with a sinful nation of Israel. And the answer was, there had to be a meeting place. There had to be a meeting place that was secure so that the Lord would not break out and kill the, the nation of Israel, but at the same time allow that intimacy, the worship, that needs to come from the relationship of the of uh, man and, and God coming together. And that was what Moses was, was told, was what the meeting place is supposed to look like. And we refer to it as the Tabernacle of Moses. Somebody asked one time, said, what's the purpose of the law? And as I was going away from the meeting, the Lord Jesus said to me, he said the law was given to be a companion of the Spirit, but not a substitute for. It was given to save life and not to kill. There was no need for the law until the Lord Jesus said, I'm going to come and live with you. Up until that point in time, the nation of Israel could have just lived like the rest of the pagans, they could have just gone ahead and done whatever they wanted to do, lived however they wanted to, just spread out over Saudi Arabia or wherever they wanted to go. But the moment that the Lord said, I'm going to come and live with you, that changed everything. And so we have to remember the purpose of the law was to protect the nation of Israel from the awesome holiness of a holy God. We need to remember one more time. Moses, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1, the writer of, Mos of uh, Hebrews says, Moses was given the rules for worship. Let's read that. Hebrews 9, 1, that first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place of worship here on the earth. Regulations were all of the law that the Lord gave to Moses as to how to draw near to him. And the place of worship was the, the holy place, the tabernacle of Moses. The priesthood of Aaron was to represent Israel before Yahweh. Let's look at that. Exodus 29, 42 through 45. These burnt offerings are to be made each day from generation to generation. Offer them in the Lord's presence at the tabernacle entrance. There I will meet with you and speak with you. I will meet the people of Israel there in the place made holy by my glorious presence. Yes, I will consecrate the tabernacle and the altar and I will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Then I will live among the people of Israel and be their God. That is so awesome. I'm real close to getting a camera operator. There is a warning for not following the rules for drawing near to Yahweh, the protocol for ministering to Him, lest you die. Leviticus 10.1 Aaron's sons, Dadab and Abihu, put coals on uh, of fire 
in their incense burners and sprinkled incense over them. In this way, they disobeyed the Lord by burning before him the wrong kind of fire, different than he had commanded. So fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and burned them up. They died there before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord meant when he said, I will display my holiness through those who come near me. I will display my glory before all the people. You know, I think this happened on the very first day that they set up the tabernacle. Moses has got the tabernacle set up. The deal is with the fire. The only fire that could be used in the entire tabernacle had to come from the brazen altar. And the Lord lit that altar himself. The fire God came down hit the wood, lit it on fire, and the, the Israelites were commanded to keep that fire going from generation to generation, even though they moved around a lot. They still had to keep the fire going. But for some reason, on the very first day, Nadab and Abihu, they get the idea that they can get fire from someplace else and put incense on it and offer an offering to the Lord. It didn't work. I kind of have a feeling that the Lord might have had in the back of his mind Aaron and the golden calf. And he wanted to make sure that the priesthood, this is the priesthood, these are the people that are going to minister to the Lord for hundreds of years. And so, uh, for whatever reason, Nadab and Amihu, they got smoked the very first day. And that's not very good. Uh, somebody said, well, the, the Lord wiped out half the priesthood in a, in a single day. He did. The, the other two sons had to step forward and become the priests with their father. So anyway, is it possible that the church, the professional church in the United States is dying because we have uh, gone away from the acceptable pattern that the Lord has given us for drawing near to Him, for worshiping Him. We've gone off on our, and I'm saying the professional church. The church, I believe, the true church of the Lord Jesus is going to rise up and it's going to worship the Lord according to His pattern. But the professional church, I believe, has departed just like Cain, Nadab, and Abihu, they are offering an offering to the Lord based on what they think they should do rather than what He is called for. That's what this video is all about, is the pattern that the Lord has shown us for drawing near to Him. The tabernacle uh, built by Moses was a movable tent prepared by man for prayer and worship and fellowship with Yahweh. It is based on the heavenly tabernacle. I think the Lord Jesus still wants us to draw near to him based on the pattern that was shown to Moses. Let's see what the scripture says. Matthew 21:12. And 13. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of thieves. The most interesting thing about the temple that was renewed by Herod, who was not an Israelite, there's a real strong probability that the presence of the Lord was not in that temple. Strong possibility that the Ark of the Covenant wasn't even in the Holy of Holies. And the, and the whole purpose of the, of the Tabernacle of Moses, the, tabernacle, the, the temple, was to be a meeting place between man and the presence of the Lord and there's a real strong possibility that that when the Lord Jesus was walking there in the temple courts 
He was the presence of the Lord that was there that the Ark of the Covenant had been missing since the time of Jeremiah and had not ever uh, returned to the temple. There is a natural priesthood and a spiritual priesthood. The natural priesthood is the one that is descended from Aaron. They're, the name I understand right now is Cohen. Uh, means priest and so there are Cohen today and they're developing a priesthood in in Israel today to begin offering sacrifices again when they do begin to build another temple they're going to start offering sacrifices in the in the uh, pita is going to go nuts whenever they start cutting the throats of those lambs on the on the uh, temple mount but it's destined to happen. They are destined, prophetically destined, to start offering sacrifices again. And so, uh, the natural priesthood based on Aaron, every male child descended from Aaron was a priest by birth. Didn't make any difference whether that male served as a priest or not they were a priest by birth okay so we have a we have a natural priesthood that is based on genealogy descended from Aaron no females only males the there is a, a spiritual priesthood and we're going to talk about Hebrews chapter 7 in just a minute but there is a spiritual priesthood when a person is born again by the Holy Spirit, it is a free gift, but it's not without responsibility. So we're getting ready to look at a spiritual priesthood versus a natural priesthood. Hebrews chapter 7, Priesthood the Bride. The priesthood based on the power of life. I was teaching uh, at a prison up in uh, northwest Oklahoma about the same time my granddaughter was probably eight nine years old and she got up before the class and she said my grandpa is in prison in and out of prison all the time and she just went and sat down she said it was amazing how much sympathy she got out of those people but I was involved in prison ministry and so I did get out they let me out but as I was teaching on the big book of Hebrews, I got to chapter 7. I didn't have anything. I, I went up there once a month, and so as I'm, every day I'm reading the book, uh, chapter 7, book of Hebrews, and didn't have anything. Right before it was time to go up there and teach, one morning the Lord showed me, opened up the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, to the priesthood of the believer. It, and I had no understanding of the priesthood of the believer. I came from a denominational background and had no understanding of it. And in about an hour's time, the Lord Jesus showed me the priesthood of the believer, the reason why Peter says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light that we can worship. Well, the Lord Jesus showed me in that hour uh, in, in uh, the Hebrews chapter 7 talks about Melchizedek who is a priest forever. It's wrong to ever say Melchizedek was because he is and he talks about the Lord Jesus who is high priest forever. But there's a word that, that, and this is what the Lord Jesus showed me, there is a word that the writer of Hebrews uses, a Greek word, and the word is zoe. And whenever it says that Melchizedek is ever living, the word is zoe. And whenever it says that the Lord Jesus is a is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek it's because he has Zoe in him. 
Well, the Lord showed me in in John, the writings of John. John John uses it more than anybody else that I could find. First uh, John five twelve and thirteen says, "Whoever has the Son has life." Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Zoe. Verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have Zoe, eternal life. Somebody asked me the other day, I was talking about getting born again, and they said, What what does that mean, being born again? I said it's a change of your spirit. You actually become alive in your spirit and you have eternal life. You have eternal life right here on the earth. And that's the reason why Peter says we're a holy nation, a royal priesthood because we have been given life. We've been given eternal life here on the earth. And and the Lord Jesus is the one who uh, gives us that life but it makes us into a priesthood so that we have the responsibility to minister to God the Father and the Lord Jesus for the people but then we have the responsibility to minister to the people in the name of the Lord Jesus guess what there's no laity in the body of Christ not in the priesthood there's no laity the whole concept of uh, clergy laity is completely against the teaching of the scripture of the priesthood of the believers. We we are all priests of the Lord who are born again, who have Zoe inside of us. There's leadership, but there's no hierarchy. Since the priesthood of Aaron experienced the glory we should experience greater manifestations of His glorious presence. If we are not experiencing the glory, it is because we have departed from the pattern. Hebrews 9.1 There are rules for approaching Yahweh. Conclusion It has been said it's not the believer that worships but the beholder. See what David says, King David says, Psalm 63, 2-8 I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live and in your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips my mouth will praise you. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. David was a worshiper. Worshiper. The meeting place for Yahweh and his bride. The priesthood of Aaron neglected the presence of Yahweh from the time of Eli all the way through the time of Saul. About 70 years without the ark. They had the tabernacle of Moses, but they did not have the ark in it. So they were going through the, the uh, rituals without the presence of God. David becomes king. He immediately moves to bring the Ark of the Covenant. Now the Ark of the Covenant, by, by my estimate, was only 20 miles from where the Ark was setting. Uh, the Ark the city with different names, but Kiriath Jerim is the last resting place that we know of that the ark was at in the time of David. Gibeon, where the tabernacle of Moses was set up, where the priests were going through all their activities every day, going through the, the stuff that they were supposed to be doing, 
They didn't have the Ark of the Covenant. It was only 20 miles away. So for 70 years, the priesthood was perfectly happy to go through the religious motions without actually worshiping the Lord, without Him actually being in the, pre in the, the tabernacle itself. Well, that wasn't satisfactory with David. And so David goes, and whenever you read in Chronicles, you can see what David went through to actually get the, the, the Ark of the Covenant. But you know what? David didn't take the Ark of the Covenant to Gibeon, where the tabernacle of David of Moses was at. He brought it to Jerusalem. And I think he put it in his own backyard. And that is referred to as the Tabernacle of David. They didn't offer blood sacrifices. They didn't do any of the stuff that we see in the that is in the, the Moses rules for drawing near the Lord. They had a tent. They had the Ark of the Covenant. They had the presence of God. They set the set the Ark in there. Anybody, I like to think that anybody that could get in the in David's backyard could draw near to the Lord. It was cool. It lasted for 40 years. For the period of time that David was king in Jerusalem, plus the amount of time it took for them to build the temple, the, a person could draw near to the Lord. They didn't have to be a priest. A woman could draw near. Anybody could draw near to the Lord. If they could, if they could get in David's backyard, they could draw near to the Lord. And that lasted for 40 years, and that's called the Tabernacle of David. You know what? They build the temple. They take the tab, They take the ark out of David's backyard, stick it in the Holy of Holies, and forget about it. It's because now the priesthood is back in charge. And so they just forget about it. Well, the Tabernacle of David, what was it? Continuous prayer, worship, singing, instruments, 24 hour a day, seven day a week, continuous worship, continuous drawing near to the Lord. According to Jewish tradition, a lot of the songs that David wrote, he would set in the presence of the Lord in, in the tabernacle and recite these wonderful psalms and things. And somebody else would write them down. That's what Jewish tradition says. Well, anybody could come in and draw near to the Lord that wanted to. 24 hour a day, seven day a week, worship and prayer, drawing near to the Lord, intimacy. And as we saw in the in the psalm, David was captivated by the presence of the Lord, by the glory of the Lord. It's very interesting that uh, in Gibeon, the tabernacle of Moses was still functioning, the priesthood was still functioning in the in Gibeon and in Jerusalem, David has the ark, 24 hour day worship prayers going on. They're only five miles apart. So you have an entire group of people going through religious activities without the presence. And in Jerusalem, they're just worshiping the Lord. They're just drawing near to the Lord, praising Him, being so thankful. I like to think that in Gibeon they were going through the motions for the benefit of the priests, but in Jerusalem they were truly worshiping for the benefits of Yahweh. Very soon in the United States and around the world, small groups of men and women will begin coming together to worship the Lord. Whether we call Him Jesus, Yeshua or Isa, we will lay down denominational tags and prejudices to become one spiritual church for the purpose of worshiping the one true God. Amos 9-11. I didn't realize the 9-11 until I was thinking about it the other day. I thought this is really... The Lord Jesus really got a sense of humor 
And so whenever Amos 9.11 is the salvation for the church, listen to what it says. On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the last days of old. So the tabernacle of David is predicted to be raised up in these last days. And James, the brother of the Lord Jesus, in the book of Acts, mentions the tabernacle of David as being connected with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to the nations. I believe as we, the priesthood, begin to worship properly and follow the proper pattern the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will go to the nations because we truly are worshiping the Lord. The tabernacle of David is soon to be rebuilt. Are you prepared to worship? I hope you will be a part of this group of believer priests that chooses to draw near to Yahweh and worship. Thank you. Goodbye.